I've been using KDE Neon on my various computers for the last month or so, and that means it's time for my long-term review. So when I do these long-term reviews, basically what I'm trying to do is get a sense of, of how well the distribution will work on hardware for a medium amount of time. So I consider a month to be a fairly good time frame to get a sense of what a distribution is all about. So this time it was KDE Neon. About a month ago I did my first impressions and I've maintained most of my views since then and I've changed some of them as well. So what's KDE Neon like after a month of use? So before we jump in, let's first talk about what KDE Neon is and what it's not. So what KDE Neon is, is a distribution that comes to us from the KDE project and at the end of the day that's its most important feature it comes to us from KDE which is going to give us the purest form of KDE that we can get anywhere in any distribution so if you want the most bleeding edge access to anything that relates to the KDE project KDE Neon gives you that opportunity so that's where it differentiates itself from things like Kubuntu, which is basically the same thing, but it is a distribution that has older versions of KDE Plasma and is more associated with Ubuntu than KDE Neon is. So at the end of the day, that's what KDE Neon is. It is the purest form of KDE that you can get, period. So the first part of the review that we have to cover is installation. So this takes us all the way back a month ago and I actually had to kind of re refresh myself on the installation of this because I'd kind of forgotten it. And that's kind of the point. The installation of KD Neon is basically like any other Calamari's based installer that you're ever going to find. It's exactly precisely the same as any of the others. And it's forgettable. It worked really well. And after I installed it again earlier a couple days ago, just to test it off again, make sure I didn't forget anything about it. The process was just as good as you'd expect with any other Calamari's installer. For me, it was actually a little bit better simply because it didn't do that whole pause and make me wait thing while it scans all my hard drives. It just moved right into the installer, which is really nice. So the installer, which you've seen a brief glimpse of during this period of the video, uh, is just a Calamari's installer and it works really well. So once you've installed it, the next thing to discuss is the out of the box experience. So what's it like when you first install it? Well, if you've ever used KDE Plasma before, basically that's what this is. It's a very minimal version of KDE Plasma sitting on top of an Ubuntu base. And at the end of the day, if you've used Kubuntu before, you've had this experience. The difference between them is not all that much. There are a few things and we'll talk about those as we go along, but for the most part, it is a plasma experience as you'd expect. Now, depending on which ISO you downloaded, you're going to have different versions of KDE Plasma. So if you're using the user edition, you're going to get the latest officially released version of KDE Plasma. If you're using the testing edition, you're going to get the pre-release software from KDE. So depending on which ISO you're using is going to decide on how bleeding edge your KDE Plasma stuff is. They also have a couple unstable editions, but most people probably aren't going to be running those. Those are mainly for developers. In terms of experience and what I chose, I ended up going with the user edition, and that's what I've been testing on all of my computers for the last month. Now, as I said, the out-of-the-box experience is a plasma experience. You're going to have the bar along the bottom, as I'm showing you right now. You're going to have a few apps pinned there along the bottom. It's going to be a very Windows-esque experience with a fairly nice wallpaper. One of my favorite things about KDE actually is their menu system. It's really nice. It does remind you a little bit of Windows, but they've done enough to the point where it just really feels nice to use. It has search integrated. It has the ability to move between different categories fairly easily. You can resize it if you want to. You can move it around. You know, it's a very nice menu system. So out of the box, it's a fairly standard KDE experience. In terms of pre-installed software, this is where it's really interesting because out of the box, I expected there to be quite a bit of K-Suite stuff. So when I say that, I mean things with K at the beginning of the name. So, you know, Conqueror and Crusader or, you know, whatever, all these KDE applications, K-Mail, things like that. You'd expect those things to be installed, but they're not. Now, it does have some KDE stuff installed out of the box. Things like Kate and KDE Connect, those things come pre-installed. Uh, consoles, obviously, here. 
KWrite is here. So there's a few K applications, but there's not all of them. And honestly, that's a little bit refreshing and it's better than I expected because I expected this being a KDE Neon or KDE project, you know, project. I expected there to be a lot of KDE stuff pre-installed, but there's not. It's a very minimal install, which is nice because it means you can build yourself up from the bottom and put all the applications that you want there instead of having to deal with all the stuff that the developer wants there. So that is really nice. Now, in terms of other pre-installed software, you get things like VLCs installed, GwenView is installed, things like that. You get Firefox as the default web browser, but there are a few things that are actually kind of missing. Like LibreOffice is not installed by default. There's not a mail application. There's not a an like an MP3 player or something like that. None of that stuff is installed. You'll have to go find that yourself. So when I say it's minimal, it really is quite minimal in terms of pre-installed software. Now let me show you what my setup looks like. So I've up to this point I've been showing you B-roll from a virtual machine that I use just for the B-roll. So this right here is what my system looks like. So I haven't done a whole bunch of customization. It looks mostly like what my first impressions video looked like back a month ago, but I've been happy with this particular setup. I wanted to use as pure a KDE experience as possible, so I didn't go installing any docs. I didn't move things around all that much. I pinned my applications, then I used it this way. Now I have changed some settings, so I've changed it so that when a new window spawns, it spawns on the correct monitor. It still doesn't follow it all the time, which is dumb, but it does it more often than it does if that settings is not set by default. Uh, I've changed several key bindings so that if I have an application open, I can quit it with control Q or super Q. I can move to different workspaces using the super and the number keys. Key bindings I'm very familiar with from a window manager perspective. So that's basically the changes that I've made. And I've been fairly happy with this particular setup. I'm not a desktop environment guy anymore. I'm a very much a tiling window manager guy. So one of the biggest problems that I've had is when I have two windows open, the way that focus works in a window manager is when I move a mouse over here, it makes that window in focus. With a desktop environment, I have to click on that in order to get that to be focused. I can't even tell you the number of times I've thought I was going to put OBS in focus so that I could move to a different scene with a key binding, but really, Audacity was still in focus and I pressed a key in Audacity that has a completely different meaning and messed everything up. It was not a great thing because I was not paying attention to where the focus is. It's just a matter of habit. It's not that big of a deal, but that's something that really tripped me up and it trips me up every time I go to a desktop environment now. I'm, and I know that there's a setting in KD Plasma because of course there is that I can use to make it so that the focus follows the mouse. But eh, I found that kind of clunky. I didn't want to really do that just because most people aren't going to do that. So I decided to just do the do it the way you're supposed to do it. So another thing that I really actually gotten used to doing is the, the alt tab thing where I can switch between different uh, applications and stuff. I'm not obviously used to doing that in a window manager. So that was something that I kind of had to work into my work workflow. And again, that's not KD, you know, neon specific, but it's something that I kind of gotten used to over the course of using this, which was, you know, an interesting feeling because I'm not used to doing it. Now, when it comes to software availability, it's a little messy. And the reason why I say that is be because KD neon supports both snaps, flat packs, and the Ubuntu repositories. And that makes it a little bit confusing as to where your applications come from. And it adds a little bit extra responsibility on the user to remember where things are and ensure that everything gets updated. Because when you install something from Discover, which is the main way you will install software unless you use the terminal, you're going to get software mainly from the Ubuntu repository. So as you can see here, if you look at the Krita entry here, the Ubuntu repository is where you're going to get that by default. But it also has snaps and flat packs or flat hub in this case available to you. So if you're just using Discover to install software, you can pretty much rely on knowing exactly where it's going to be updated from. And if you do all of your updates from here as well, it will update stuff for you. That being said, if you don't use Discover to 
install and update your software, it gets a little bit messy. So I don't use Discover all that often. I'll just talk about Discover here in a second again, but I use the terminal. So things like, you know, I do sudo apt install or whatever, or I'd use, you know, flat pack install. I'd never use snap install because I don't want to use snaps, but you kind of get the point. If you install things from multiple different places, it's going to be your responsibility to make sure all of those things stay updated. So it gets a little messy. So another thing that is not to my liking is that it has snaps installed. I don't like snaps. I don't want to use snaps. And I don't. you don't have to use snaps. You can uninstall snaps. But let me show you the reason why I don't like snaps. There is in your home directory this file right here. And it cannot be gone or deleted if you're going to continue to use snaps. It's ridiculous because we know from using Ubuntu that that directory does not have to exist. But if you're using a different distro, even if it's based on Ubuntu, you're going to see that. And it's just, it's dumb. I can't stand it. End rant. But again, in terms of software availability, there is a wide selection of software because you have access to the three, basically the three main and largest repositories in terms of software on Linux. So if there's something you need to find, chances are you'll be able to find it from one of those three sources. Personally, I've been getting most of my stuff from Flatpak, so I'm used to doing that as a Fedora user, so all the stuff like Ferdium, Discord, Audacity, OBS, Steam, all that stuff I installed through Flatpak. Now, as I said in my initial impressions, there is another package manager on KD Neon that I'd never heard of before, and that is called PKCon. Now, from the things that I've been told and the things that I've read, PKCon is is the package manager that the KD Neon developers use to update and manage their packages. Now, the reason why this is confusing is because it's not a developer fronted thing. And what I mean by that is that the first time you update your system, it's going to tell you to use PKCon. And that's a little confusing if you're expecting this to behave exactly like Ubuntu. Now, it's not a hard package manager to get a hold of. It does basically the same stuff as apps does. So you have PK and PKCon install, PKCon search, stuff like that. All that stuff works exactly the same way as app does in terms of at least syntax. And in terms of actually, you know, working, if you do PKCon like update, it's going to look a little bit like Nala. It's not exactly as flashy as Nala, but it has some of the same quirks as Nala, if you will. So that's what PKCon is. Once you have that first like warning, uh, that first time you try to use apt and it tells you to use this instead, you never see that again. And you can use apt however you want, because this is Ubuntu. You can just use apt. And that's what I've been doing. I haven't used PKCon since that initial time. So which one they want you to use, I'm not exactly sure. And I'm not sure why they try to push PKCon on you. What's the the advantages to it? It's never really explained all that well. So for me personally, I just used apt when I had to, or I used flat packs to install the software that I needed. So that's what I've been doing. So that takes care of software availability. If there's a package that you want, there's a good chance that you'll be able to find it within one of these sources. I don't think there was a single thing that I actually had to build w that I wanted. Most of the stuff is in FlatHub, and there might have been like, I think I installed like NeoFetch and HTOP from the Ubuntu repositories. Those are like the only other things. So software availability on KD Neon is really, really good. So let's move on to the next section, which is gaming. Now, before we jump in and I show you some of the footage that I used during my gameplay, let me talk about the fact that I'm not a gamer. I think if you've watched the channel for any amount of time, you know that I say this often. I'm not a gamer. I haven't been a gamer in quite some time. The games that I play tend to be very casual. You know, I like Hearthstone. I like Clash of Clans. You know, those are the types of games that I've gotten into. I'm not a first-person shooter anymore. I used to be back when Call of Duty was like a really big thing. The first time, at least, you know, like the first three or four, I was a big gamer back then, but not anymore. And I was never really good at it, and that's part of the reason why I've kind of gotten away from it. So, as I talk about gaming, keep that in mind, because I'm not a gamer. 
So let's talk then about gaming itself on KD Neon. In terms of installing Steam and getting it up and running, it was kind of a frustrating mess. And the reason why I say that is mostly because the Flatpak version of Steam has this really annoying habit, at least for me, on my account, where the first time you launch it, it opens up like four or five invisible windows that you can't see. You can see them if you hover over the icon and it like will have like invisible windows as in the previews. But on the desktop themselves, they don't show up. They're like ghosts. And the problem with them is that you can't interact with the main Steam window while those things are open. And you can't close them. <laughs> you know, you can't like close them through the preview in KD, in the KD panel like you would think you could. So I actually had to use HTOP to kill Steam four times in order for me to actually get to Steam. Now, this is not a KD Neon specific problem. I just mentioned it here because it happened to me. Once I got past that and managed to get those invisible windows to close, I was able to install both Warframe, Orbital Bullet, and City Skylines. And I played all three of them. Two of those you're going to see B-roll here starting now. In terms of performance, I thought it was pretty good. Now, that's a very scientific statement, I know. In terms of frame rate, I saw between 45 and 57 frames per second. I didn't have Bingo HUD open at the time, when I recorded this, so you'll have to take my word for it. But on my particular hard drive, which includes a Ryzen 3800X and a uh, and a Radeon RX 580, that's perfectly acceptable in terms of performance. It was very playable. And yet in the Warframe example, that is a Windows only game as far as I'm aware. It's what it says in Steam anyways. And that means it's running in Proton. So the fact that it was running that well on my system is pretty good. And my only complaint with it was that it made my the fans in my computer spin up like a 747. You know, it was very, very loud. Now, that might just be my computer. I've had that problem before with Windows-specific binaries. So that might be something just going on with my hardware. But again, just something to keep in mind. In terms of performance itself, it wasn't affected. And it was very, very playable. It was, it was very good. Orbital Bullet was similarly about 60 frames per second and it, again very very playable that's not a very resource intensive game and it's a linux native game so it just played really really well city skylines was the surprise for me because i used it and normally on linux city skylines is about the crashiest piece of nonsense software you've ever met i love the game i want to play more of the game i'd love to start a channel where i you know just played city skylines because that stuff does really well on youtube but I can't because it's always crashing on Linux and I refuse to use Windows. So when I used it on KD Neon, I expected it to be like that. But I was surprised. City Skylines didn't crash one time in about 45 to 50 minutes that I played with it per day. You know, I played it a lot over the course of the last month on KD Neon and it played really, really well. I'm not sure what the frame rates were because I never actually tested them, but the in terms of you know like stability which is the big thing for city skylines it played really really well so i was quite i was quite happy with that those are the only three games that i tried so if you are a gamer you're probably a little bit disappointed i i'm not a gamer so i can't tell you what destiny would look like if it even plays on on linux i don't even know i have it in my library i don't think i've ever played it uh so uh csgo is the one that people normally use to benchmark this stuff but i'm horrible at CSGO and I refuse to record myself playing it so uh, you're just going to have to download it yourself and give it a chance because I wasn't going to um, subject myself to you playing that game which I'm absolutely uh, garbage at so yeah that is the gaming section honestly I was surprised at how good gaming was outside of the whole steam nonsense there that I talked about at the beginning it was a good experience but it was a good experience for me and non-gamer People who are gamers and play a lot of games may have a different experience. I just want to be honest about that. So that is gaming. Moving on to stability. Now, this is general operating system wise stability. I had no problems. Like I didn't have any, outside of like one K win crash when I was doing my initial impressions. I haven't had any of those problems since. And that's really nice. Uh, I have had some issues where the theming capability in the settings panel doesn't really work all that often. So I'm going to show you a picture here of an error that I actually got this morning. So I got this pic this 
error here this morning as I was trying to install another theme. And this error just kept popping up and would not go away and would not allow me to interact with the window underneath it. So I don't know what was going on there. That was just this morning, like I said. And I haven't seen that since. Like if I open it up the settings panel now and go to appearance and then get new global themes and then sort by highest rated, we're going to see if we have that same problem. Nope. See, nothing's wrong there. And that's been basically my experience over the last month. Sometimes I've had some issues, but for the most part, it's been fairly decent. Usually the biggest problem I've had is when I tried to install something while I was recording OBS. And I think that there's some kind of incompatibility there between changing a theme or installing a theme and running OBS to record at the same time. Those things, to, those two things just do not go together. And that's the reason why I'm not going to do that right now on camera. When I haven't been using OBS, it works fairly easily. Like I've installed a couple different ones and uh, it works just fine. Usually that's the biggest problem that I have with KD. And this time it turned out that it was a fairly okay situation. So in terms of stability outside of that, again, I haven't had any issues whatsoever. And that includes when I received the notification that I could switch from the LTS of 20.04 20 to the 22.04 LTS, which is something that just happened yesterday. I got this notification, it popped up, would you like to update? And I did. So I went through the process. It took about a half an hour. It rebooted the computer when it was done and it just worked. The only thing that was really weird about the whole situation was it changed my wallpaper. Like I had a wallpaper set back there that was completely different and it changed the wallpaper so yeah i'm not i'm not sure you know why i did that but it did it it seems to be a little bit weird a little bit invasive a little bit maybe even uh but you know it did it and it's not that big of a deal it's just something that i noticed so stability really good and you'd expect that it runs on ubuntu lts you wouldn't expect it to not be stable so I had no problems with that. Now, speaking of problems, let's talk about some problems that I did have. So there are a few. So the first one is that my monitors refuse to go to sleep. So I think I, I believe I talked about this in my initial impressions. I have not been able to find a solution for it since. For whatever reason, my monitors just will not go to sleep. Now I have them set so that they'll go to sleep after five minutes. And if you go down to the power menu in the the power management system here thing, it will tell you exactly what applications are blocking your monitors from going to sleep. So right now OBS is keeping my monitors from going to sleep. The thing is, is that even if that wasn't the case, like I had uh, OBS closed, my monitors still won't go to sleep. I'm not sure why. Now, I, I when I talk about support here in a minute, I'll talk about what I've done to try to fix this and who I've contacted for help. But just needless to say, I have not gotten it to be fixed. So that's honestly the biggest problem that I've had with KD Neon throughout the month. It's meant that I've had to manually turn my monitors off, which is a pain in the rear because the power buttons are in odd places and they're hard to reach. So that's the, probably, the again, the biggest problem that I had with KD Neon. Uh, another one that I've had an issue with, is, and this is, a, this, this is a pipeware problem, not a KDE problem, but Pipewire, after a reboot, does not remember your sources. So, like, the sources are there, it just not, doesn't remember the default sources. So every time I reboot, I had to make sure that I was using the right microphone and not my webcam microphone. That's always annoying, and please, whoever develops Pipewire, please fix this, because this is, I mean, it, it's, I can't even tell you how many times I've forgotten to check that I'm using the right source and found that I'm not, and I've ended up recording a whole video through my webcam microphone, which is garbage. So that needs to be fixed. I mean, I, it's, it's, a, it's a bug. But again, that's not a KD Neon thing. That is Pipewire specific. That happens in Fedora too. So that's a pain in the butt. The last thing that I want to talk about in terms of problems I had is the bugs that I showed you earlier. So I had this bug here. I've had the settings application crash once or twice, but that was both, that was before I did that first impressions video. Since then, I haven't had settings crash again. So I don't know what was going on there, but there's but there have been some things like icons not showing up, stuff like that that has happened. Another thing that I wanted to talk about in this section is that Cavantum is not in the repositories. Despite all the things that I said earlier about software availability being really, really good, uh, getting Cavantum on your system is actually kind of a pain in the tuchus. And if you don't know what Cavantum is, Cavantum basically allows you to 
theme your system outside of the settings panel in cool ways. So it allows you to add extra blur and allows you to control that blur in a more fine-tuned manner than you would be able to in the settings panel. And it does a whole bunch of other stuff too. Plus there's a whole bunch of pre-built themes that you can use through Cavantum. So you'd think that Cavantum would be in a repository somewhere, but it's not. You have to build it yourself. And that was, uh, that was, that's weird. Um, that's just, I mean, it's, it feels like it should, honestly, this should be pre-installed on KD Neon. You'd think it would be, but it's not. So that was a little weird. It was easy to build, but it's still something that I noticed. Okay, so moving on then to community and support. So when you're talking about like Kubuntu or any of the other Ubuntu flavors, the community part is always like, oh my God, it's awesome because it's so big and it's Ubuntu, right? Well, this is based on Ubuntu, but it's not a, an Ubuntu flavor. So in terms of community support, it was kind of hit or miss. Now, I'm not saying that like the community is bad or anything. It's just small. And if you are going to need immediate help, the response time is not really all that great. So if you're if you're needing immediate support, the forums isn't the best place to get support. I posted this one, I think it was really early this morning or yesterday morning. I'm not actually sure. It says it was today, but I'm pretty sure it was yesterday. Uh, e either way, I'm not sure what's going on there with the time. But the point is, is that... It hasn't received a response yet, but I mean, it was only been a day or so, whatever. I posted another one at the beginning of the month and that one did receive some, some responses, but it took a couple days. So the point I'm trying to make here is that if you need immediate, you know, an immediate support, the forums aren't the best place just because it feels like the community when it comes to at least the KDE Neon subsection of the KDE forums is pretty small. So if you have a KDE specific problem, there might be a better chance of you getting help in the more general KDE topics. Those tend to get a little bit more traffic than the KDE Neon specific forum does. So just to keep that in mind. So in terms of places where you can get other support, and probably that's probably more immediate, KDE Neon does have a matrix room and a mailing list. So those are two places where you could get more uh, information and more support than just the forums itself. So there are other places that you can get support other than just the KDE forums. The KDE Neon subsection of that forum just seems to be a bit abandoned. Maybe not abandoned, but slow. It'd probably be a better way to put it. So in terms of support, it's not great. And really the only reason I say that is because the one place that I focused on was kind of slow. Now, like I said, the post that I posted outside of the KDE Neon stuff had much more interaction. So if you have a more general KDE problem, posting it there is going to have a much better community response. So finally, let's talk a little bit about who this is for. At the end of the day, it really is for the people who want the purest KDE experience. If you are looking for the latest and greatest of KDE software presented in the way that the KDE project wants it presented, KDE Neon is the best option for you. It's also a very good Ubuntu based distribution. So if you are a, an Ubuntu person and you liked Kubuntu, but you want more up-to-date Plasma versions, KD Neon is a good option. Also, forgive me about the dog. She's gonna bark for here for a few minutes. If you aren't a Plasma person and you don't think you would enjoy Plasma, there's no good reason to run uh, KD Neon really. It's, it doesn't have any other versions. It's meant to be for the people who love KDE, want to use KDE, and want to envelop themselves in the KDE ecosystem. And there are those people out there, lots of them, you know, like and enjoy Plasma. And KDE Neon gives them access to the purest form of Plasma, which is something that a lot of people will enjoy. So my overall experience of it with it was very good. Uh, I did have some of those problems there at the beginning that I talked about in my first impressions video, but after that, it was just a very good experience on Ubuntu, and using Plasma itself is a good experience. If you like to customize stuff, Plasma is where it's at. Like, it, you cannot find a single desktop environment out there that can be customized as much as Plasma, period. Like, it's the most customizable desktop environment ever. So, if you like that kind of stuff, Plasma is fantastic. And if you do like that stuff and you like Plasma, 
KDE Neon is a good distribution for you to get into simply because it's the best form of KDE that you're probably going to find anywhere else. So that is KDE Neon. Again, I really, really liked it. Now the question would be, will I be keeping it installed? And the answer to that is no. And the reason why is not having anything to do with KDE Neon itself. It's just I'm not an Ubuntu person. I'm a Fedora guy. I prefer uh, Fedora's version of KDE. So it's just, you know, really comes down to taste. I prefer Fedora over Ubuntu. Therefore, I'm not as much of a fan of Neon on my personal systems. But if I were to want that purest, you know, KDE Plasma experience, KDE Neon would be my first choice. So if you have thoughts on KDE Neon, you can leave those thoughts in the comment section below. I'd love to hear from you. You can follow me on Twitter at the LinuxCast or on Mastodon or Odyssey. Those links will be in the video description. You can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash LinuxCast, just like all these fine people. Thanks to everybody who does support me on Patreon and YouTube. You guys are all absolutely amazing people. Without you, the channel would just not be anywhere near where it is right now. So thank you so very much for your support. Thanks to everybody for watching. I'll see you next time.